I think um, being Christian is actually really hard to do. Um, and I don't think it's being so. I think it's being um, actually it's very manly because you're going against the grain. You're going against um, societal norms. You know, I'm sorry to say, but anybody can pull a trigger. You know, I was doing it at, at a really young age, you know, and you don't have to think much. It takes five pounds of pressure, you know, and you just squeeze and that's it. But in order to actually think for somebody else, to relate to somebody else, it takes a lot to put your pride down and accept and actually listen deeply to what somebody is saying, who who is your enemy. It takes so much strength, you know, and I do I have to do that on a regular basis. And that's because when I go into these prisons, I see enemies. I've seen people who I've shot at on the streets, who've shot at me. But when we come together with that common goal of, well, you have depression and I had depression. Let's help each other out. It forms a bond that I believe the enemy, which is Satan, did not want for us. He wants to divide and separate us. And, and to come together and put aside your differences is the hardest thing to do for anybody, gang member or not. Johnny Chang, thank you for coming today. My pleasure. It's great to have you, man. Your story is remarkable. It's a, it's a, it's really a, a story of the be going through the belly of the beast, going through the darkness to get to the light. Yes. And um, you know your your story is interesting because a lot of people have heard of the watching, and you you are not a dropout by any means, but you've just graduated from the street life, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the history of watching is something that a lot of us uh, came to know by way of a lot of documentaries um, starting in 1968 in San Francisco. Right. You know, we, we, we've said this before on the podcast that all roads to hell are paved with good intentions, right? Yes. And it seems like the watching was started to protect Chinese youth. Is that is that your understanding of the history? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, we started, like most gangs, we started... Um, being picked on and after that you know of course it went kind of left but uh, for the most part we started as as a unified uh, movement to kind of protect ourselves yeah it seems like that's the genesis of most gangs you look at the italian mafia they protected the neighborhood so old ladies could walk at night and not be harmed but then they started to extort their own people right, right. exactly the interesting history is and a lot of uh, Americans might know, not know about Tongs, but the Hop Sing Tong was a community organization, right? Yes, it was. Yes. In San Fran. And yes. then the Wa Ching became kind of their street muscle. Is that your understanding of? Yeah, my understanding of it. Yeah, we were the muscle. We were the enforcers, as they say. But yeah, we did all the, the dirty work. <laughs> and a very famous Wa Ching incident involved the Golden Dragon Massacre. Mm -hmm where uh, the rival Joe boys came in and aired out the whole restaurant. Right. And they didn't kill one gangster. They didn't. They killed a lot of civ innocent civilians, you know. And from what I heard, those people actually got released recently. You know, they did a lot of time in prison. And it's sad to say, but, you know, it's, it's really uh, misunderstandings and things that could have been talked about that could have been communicated. But, I mean, you know, everything happens for a reason. So, you know. Yeah, and you know one of their intended targets was uh, a very famous gangster named Shrimp Boy, and and you know did was Shrimp Boy kind of a legend in watching circles? Uh, I think for the San Francisco area people, yeah. But you know we're from the San Gabriel Valley, so it's it's a little bit different, you right? Know? You yeah. know when Shrimp Boy kind of turned against the watching and w really took control of the Hop Sing Tong. Mm. And in, in this documentary, it says that the watching that were pushed out of the San Francisco area ended up settling in the San Gabriel Valley. Is that true or is that kind of a miss? That's fairly accurate. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned to me that the, there's different watching factions. You have Oceanside, which you're a part of. Mm -hmm. You have Ken side, Sunny side. But are the, those all based in the San Gabriel Valley, roughly? Yes. 
San Gabriel Valley or Southern California, but mostly San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. And would you say, could, could you be white or of a different ethnicity and patch into the watching? Uh, we've had different races, but for the most part, I mean, the name again means Chinese youth. So, um, but you know, it, whoever you grow up with, we've had Hispanics in our gang as well. It's really mo more of a family oriented thing. You know, if you grew up with somebody from, you know, an adolescent, then yeah, they're most more than likely to join your gang if you're in that gang. In 1993, at a pool hall in El Monte, mm -hmm. and a, a, a gangster named Kicker came in, mm -hmm. and he was from the Asian Boys, correct? Yes. And he kind of started pressing up and, and you know, uh, flexing on some watching gangsters, mm -hmm. at which point in time, a watching gangster named China Dog basically dispatched him with his own pistol. Yeah. And when when that incident occurred, were did that change the dynamic of everything? Definitely, um, that actually put us on the map. I would say, you know, prior to that, I'm sure people knew about us, but everyone has seen that. I think it's 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 hit like more than two million views, you know, alone that video of somebody sadly getting murdered. But at the same time, you know, China Dog is doing a lot more better things nowadays with his life. I speak to his pastor. You know, so uh, it's it's pretty amazing, you know, what he's how he's turned his life around. Do you remember China Dog from back in the day? No, I was too young. Okay. You know, I, I banged in the early 2000s, um, like late 90s, early 2000s. He was an older generation, what we would call an OG. Yeah. Okay. But but you had a chance meeting with China Dog recently, right? Yeah, we, we met, um, you know, through uh, his his God's Parks ministry, which is his um, uh, his pastor through his pastor. And his pastor is actually uh, one of the one of the heads back in the day of, of a gang that he started, which I can't really comment on. But he yeah, I went there and I spoke uh, essentially. Um, I gave my testimony at his church, you know, and, and he does awesome. park ministry. Johnny, your story is interesting because you end up catching a case mm -hmm. that puts you in the big house for 12 years, mm -hmm. which is a significant stretch. Sure. Had you found the Lord yet or no? No, no. It was actually towards the last two months when I paroled at a CRC Norco, a level two yard. That's when I, I found found God. So you were still very much active and, and with the yeah. business and the politics. Yeah, sadly, I was still um, part of general population. Uh, never rolled it up, never PC'd up, but yeah. And and during that time at Ironwood, uh, did you, did your, your mother, did she try to bring you to God? Did she send you scriptures or? You know, it, uh, my mom actually grew up Buddhist. So she was a Taoist Buddhist, which is pretty hardcore. They do a lot of chants and, and um, but she would give me these chants. And, she, you know, of course, we didn't chant or anything. Um, I was I didn't believe in God at the time, nor did I really believe in Buddha. Um, but, yeah, she tried to bring me as well as my brother, um, who was also doing time in prison. Um, but she noticed that um, her life was really like, it was really bad. You know, she had an abusive husband who was alcoholic. Um, she had pancreatic cancer. Mm. Um, she had two kids um, in prison for a long time, you know, and she was realizing that she was trying to put good into this world, but her whole life was just bad and filled with evil and wickedness. So um, that's when she found God. So in the beginning, yes, she started with Buddhism. She would give me chants and things like that. But Towards the end, she started talking about Jesus, which kind of blew my mind. <laughs> Do you remember as a as a child going to temple with her to Buddhist temple and lighting incense and? Yes, yes, I remember going there and seeing the monks dressed the way that they were dressed in orange with like robes and bald headed and, um, yeah, we had one on Main Street. I forgot the name of it, but it was on Main. It was a real big Buddhist temple. I don't know if it's still there, but we would go there in Alhambra all the time as kids. You know, to people who aren't from Southern California, LA area, how would you describe Alhambra, Monterey Park, Rosemead area? Is it predominantly Asian? Yeah, it's predominantly Asian. There's a lot of Cantonese, so Southern Southern um, Chinese, and uh, there's a lot of Vietnamese people there too. It's pretty diverse, but I would say most, when it comes to Asians, it's mostly Cantonese, Southern, Southern Chinese. Yeah, I've been to the Vancouver Chinatown 
San Francisco Chinatown, New York Chinatown, our LA Chinatown isn't much of 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 what you'd expect a Chinatown to be. It right. seems like Alhambra Monterey Park is the real Chinatown, right? Yeah, they call it the new Chinatown. Right. Yeah, so the homies call it new Chinatown. From I have some friends from who grew up in Chinatown and they they call us the new Chinatown. They come to our areas to eat right. legit Chinese food. <laughs> that's where you get the OG Chinese food right. and that's where everyone goes to get the real stuff yeah. and the real markets and yeah. it's still very much a dominantly Chinese area. Yes. Did your memories growing up in Alhambra, did, do you have good memories or was it filled with violence and turmoil? It was both. Um, I had some good memories, um, you know, hanging out with friends and stuff, but a lot of it was filled with violence and the prison system being locked up at 12. You know, it's I, I really remember more of the prison stuff than I do of happy memories. Yeah. Do you do you feel like you're institutionalized? Uh, I think when I first got out, you know, yes. But uh, as of now, not so much. But there was times where, yeah, I felt like I was institutionalized. Um, if you're doing more than, you know, 10 years, I think it, it really does have some kind of effect on you. Um, for the longest time, I thought I had like PTSD. I would wake up with like, you know, crazy nightmares, still being in prison, stuff like that. Um, that a lot of people can relate to who've done long stretches, more than a nickel, more than five years or whatnot. So, yeah. Were there any skills you learned in prison that were transferable to your, like, do you still wake up at 4 a.m.? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, prison gave me like OCD. <laughs> it made me really, really clean. It made me wash down the cell, break down the bed, all kinds of stuff. So I still utilize that every day. And, and, um, you know, people who meet me, they're like, dude, your, your house is so clean. Like, how is this possible? You know, well, you know, we would get, we would get kind of like disciplined if we didn't have our things in order, basically. And I learned that from prison. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people comment, you know, from out of state, they can't believe how segregated the California prison system is. Mm -hmm. You, yeah. you, you, your enemy on the streets is now your homeboy behind prison behind the bars right 100 percent, 100 and that's the thing that was culture shock for me was when i went in there and i was like dude i think this guy's from asian boys or i think this guy's from vietnamese boys or and then they're like nah he has to be your homie and when they laced me up meaning they gave me the rules and regulations of the yard i was shocked you know i was like i was just shooting at these people you know a few weeks ago and now we have to share spread and 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 he's giving me a care package and all this stuff so it's it's really um it's really crazy you know the experience in prison have you been able to lace up your younger homeboys that are coming up and explain to them hey your op on the street is going to be your your boy in prison have you have you kicked that knowledge to them yeah absolutely you know i let them know but again gang banging is gang banging and everybody has to learn on their own you know, not everyone will listen to what you have to say just because you have the label of big homie or OG. It doesn't really matter. I mean, at the end of the day, um, each man is going to make his own bed and he has to lay in it, you know. But we try our best, at least for me, to guide the, the people, not just them, but people around me um, and see that a lot of this stuff is actually pointless and it's it's fairly satanic, actually. The battle between good and evil has, it's it's so biblical in it, in, yeah. in its sense. And you know, you, you, we talked about the food dog on your neck and, you know, the, the concept of having two dogs inside us, right? Yeah. One is a very vicious and evil dog. Yeah. The other is very benevolent. And how do you feed the good dog? Mm -hmm. How have you been able to do that? So for me, it was realizing not trusting myself. So at a young and early age, I was taught that you must trust yourself. I think everyone in this world is taught, follow your heart, believe in yourself, you know, trust your gut, trust your feelings. But I realized that when I did everything I wanted to do, I ended up in places like prison and that it was actually wrong to fully trust myself. Nowadays, the generations don't have a lot of deep thinking because they have this iPad or things like movies and Netflix. They, they don't have to think. They can just turn on the screen and just tune out. And What's up, guys? This is Johnny Chang, and you guys are watching Cinemills TV. Day, we actually had to think. You know, we had to find things to do and entertain ourselves. You know, sadly, we went the wrong route and we became gang members. But a lot of the times, 
feeding that good dog we there's actually a, a folklore in chinese where there's two there's two wolves it's not dogs but there's a white wolf and a black wolf the black wolf is the e is the evil wolf and the white wolf is the clean and it has all the the happiness and good things um but like you had mentioned it's who you feed so if i'm thinking negative things all the time if i'm thinking despair and and anger and frustration all the time then i'm feeding that black wolf which will then again internalize and eat me alive essentially Whereas if I'm thinking positive things, I'm thinking about God, I'm thinking about ministry, I'm thinking about helping people, I'm thinking for other people rather than myself, that's when I start to do good. Because at the end of the day, we everyone is selfish to an extent. But if we learn to think for other people, if we think about the actions that we do that will affect others and we live for others, that's when we become truly happy. So you're at service to your fellow man. Yes. You've put your money where your mouth is because you go into prisons and you speak to troubled, at-risk youth. Yes, youth and inmates, adults. And inmates, and you give them a sense of hope in such a despair place, right? Yes, yes. I, I feel like, um, you know, how I came to God was through the same uh, prison ministry that I am now part of. Um, I was, again, Buddhist, but... I didn't really believe in God, but when they came to prison, they taught, they gave an example of like, um, they had a, a slideshow of these eggs, right? And it was like eagle eggs. And they asked the question, what can the eggs do for themselves to hatch? And we were thinking about it, you know, the, the, the group was about 35 inmates. And we, we came to the conclusion that we couldn't do anything. The eggs couldn't do anything to hatch. They couldn't roll or speed up their process. It needed an external source, which was the parent, mother or father sitting on the egg after 30 days, providing warmth. The egg came out and became, you know, an eagle. So likewise, we cannot, um, we cannot obtain eternal righteousness by ourselves. We cannot do good by ourselves. We actually needed help. And that's when I was able to realize, like, all my life I was trying to live this perfect life for myself. But I was living the opposite, imperfectly. And so that's when I realized I'm an imperfect person trying to produce perfection. No wonder I fell into depression and sadness. Because no matter what, when I was happy, I was happy. But when I was sad, I was depressed. So I lived this up and down lifestyle. And that's what I teach the inmates. And a lot of them can relate. Because inmates, contrary to popular belief, people think that inmates are ruthless and, and evil people. They're actually the most respectful people that I've ever met in this world. Believe it or not, you know, they just did certain things that caused them to end up in prison. We all make mistakes, but they actually are searching and seeking that happiness and hope, hopefulness in their life. You mentioned depression, and, and I, I remember you saying that you thought of killing yourself about three times during mm -hmm. your life. Yeah. And how serious were those thoughts at that moment? They were very strong. You know, uh, at that time, I was isolated. Um, even though I was around people um, emotionally, mentally, I, like I was isolated. And those thoughts were very amplified for me. You know, it came as a very soothing voice. It was like, you know, if you end it now, your whole life, like all the sadness, it will just end and you'll be able to rest. But at that point, I was shocked because I was like, how can I be listening to this voice? You know, I try to do overdoses and stuff like that. And um you know so i was really really yeah depressed at that moment and i was just isolated and that was something that made me really um fall deeper into depression when i was by myself i was making 30 to forty thousand dollars a month i was trapping but the crazy thing was inside of my heart i had no self-control i had no happiness even though i made that money i was still empty inside of my heart so there's a giant void in your life right yes and that void has been filled with the Holy Spirit now. Yeah. And you've come to Jesus. You're you're a minister, mm -hmm. and you, you could could this Johnny have reached twelve year old, sixteen year old gang banging Johnny? Like, could you have spoken into that kid or no? Uh, absolutely. You could have. Yeah, yeah, I think I could have. I think I do that often. You know, I counsel a lot of young young kids, not just the little homies, but people who are, you know. Um, in bouts, not even gang related, just people who are sad and, and, and miserable, even though they're 14, 15, 16 years old, they have this emptiness. 
I believe everyone, it doesn't matter how old you are, they all have bouts of emptiness. So for me, um, I had to, when I looked at my life, I thought it was a curse. You know, why am I in YA at the age of 12? This is not normal, seeing people get stabbed and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and then, you know, but now when I look at my life, going into prisons, the way that I look, I can see that people respect it off bat because they can tell that, hey, he's been through something probably more than some guy who's a pastor who comes in dressed up, nice, clean cut, you know. So when I speak to people, we, we can relate. And I didn't want this life. I didn't wake up and go, you know what, I'm going to be a prison minister today. No, I believe God had his plan for me. And he allowed me to go through a lot of things, even to the point of joining the gang, like the dubs that I'm from, the mo one of the most ruthless gangs in our area. Like God has led me to where I'm at now. So I definitely believe I can speak and reach to a lot of the youth. Have you noticed as you walk a more righteous path that Satan attacks you even harder? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've experienced that a lot, you know, where I'll be in the streets and people will recognize me now through Lucky's podcast, through Hoodstocks or through just different podcasts that I've been on. And um, I'm sure there's certain people who will say certain things, but I drown that out because I realize if I trust myself, let's say like the old Johnny, right? The Oceanside Johnny would, I, I, I couldn't even stand people looking at me wrong. It would be a problem off bat if you looked at me wrong. I would have to get you. I'd have to come up to you. I have to do something physical to you. But I learned when I trusted myself, I could only live a life either buried under prison um, or dead. You know, so um, I chose not to trust myself nowadays. It's like I'm not going to follow what I feel. The first instinct that comes out of me, I'm not going to follow that. Of course, anger comes and frustration comes and, you know, things like that come. But. I don't allow it to affect me because I don't trust in that. I know that that's not from me. You know, Satan says, I am in you, but not you, right? So a lot of things that come out of us, we think is from us. It's actually not from us. It's very demonic, right? Yes. Yeah. Now you, you've got the tattoos, the, the, the kind of, it's, it's your past, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're walking around Alhambra, have, have anybody hit you up like, Hey, where are you from, bro? Have you had that? So I actually, um, believe it or not, through the podcast, a lot of people already recognize where I'm from. And obviously growing up in that area, people tend to stare, but it's, it's actually really respectful. And I believe God has allowed that because I don't really have to watch my back all the time anymore. You know, um, I think that nowadays the, the era of gangbanging has kind of changed the dynamic of gangbanging. But yeah, there are people who have hit me up, you know, and I mean, I mean, I let them know like, yeah, this is who I am, but you know, we're still doing ministry. We're still doing prison work. And when I see these souls, they're very lost. They're empty inside of their hearts and they just are looking for something to give them hope, whether it's gang banging or drugs or alcohol or whatever. So for me, I, I don't really handle it the way that I normally would handle it. Right. Oh, I'm from whatever, whatever, throwing yeah. up gang signs. No, right. it's more of just like speaking to them and having a, a dialogue and communication. 100%. Yeah. And you know, the irony behind the city we live in, Los Angeles, it's really the city of demons. It's the home of the <laughs> right. hater, right? There's yeah. so many guys that don't want to see you win. Yeah. They don't want to see you go. Yeah. There's so many political lines. It's very tough to navigate. But you, you know, the the saying that comes to mind when a man's world is when a man is right, his world is right. Yeah. So you you're not really getting the negative. Yeah. spears thrown at you yeah it's crazy i'm getting more of the positive i think the way that um the evil spirit utilizes like the way that he attacks me is through mental things like thoughts you know but other than that i mean he's really um i haven't really had any issues with anybody and the good thing about prison too i believe which was lined up by god was when you go there you know everybody so even if something does happen, you know, like probably the guy's OG and, you know, you, you, you'll know somebody from whatever gang, because when you go to prison, you know, everybody. But let me ask you this. If I steal a candy bar mm -hmm. from a liquor store and if I kill a rival gang member, mm -hmm. is that sin in God's eyes the same? Yeah. So sin actually is um, what people think is they think it's missing the mark. But true sin is unbelief. If you look at John chapter 16, verse 9, 
it says of sin because they believe not unto me so when you don't believe in somebody uh that's when you can't follow them or accept anything that they say you know i have i I use an example let's say i was to give you um ten thousand dollars and i say hey meet me in arizona next week i'll give you 10 g's if you believe in me you'll make that trip to go to arizona and have ten thousand dollars right and you'll accept it from me but let's say you don't believe ah johnny he's just capping he's not gonna do that even if i go there with ten thousand dollars that ten thousand doesn't become yours do you understand if you don't believe so likewise sin is the same way well you know i don't believe in god so i'm gonna do this and then they start to judge well still in a candy bar is not as bad as shooting somebody yeah according to you but you're not the judge you know, god is saying if you believe in me right then that's that's not sin that's righteousness if you don't it's very simple if you don't believe in me then it's sin because once you don't believe in him you're not going to follow him you're not going to trust him you're not even going to listen to him you're going to do everything you want to do and that's that's sin is essentially i'm not going to follow god i'm gonna i'm gonna do what i feel is good so even if it's a good intention like starting the gang we had mentioned it seemed like a good thing but it always gets corrupted so johnny a lot of people have a relationship with God and some some go by way of Buddha mm -hmm. by Muhammad Zeus the great spirit but you 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 chose to go to God through Jesus mm -hmm. is Jesus the only way to God in your opinion or your uh in my belief yeah it it, it is he is because it says in the Bible I am the way the light and the truth so when you say the way it means only way Right. So it's not a disrespect on other religions, but for the most part, like when I was in prison, I studied a lot on Buddhism. I studied a lot on Islam, too. And um, all religions, if you actually think about it, it, it all teaches you to do well. You know, what religion teaches you to just murder people? Right? It doesn't do that. Right. But uh, Christianity for me was the only religion that taught me that I can't do it by myself, that I needed an external source to help me. Because that depression, that loneliness, that emptiness, I couldn't bring myself out of that. And for me, God, uh, through Jesus, when he died on the cross, he washed all of our sins perfectly, past, present, and future. And so I was a big sinner. But when I saw that, I was like, wow, I'm righteous. Like, it sounded absurd to me. Although it didn't make sense to me, when I accepted it, I was able to live a righteous path. Prior to that, I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm a sinner, so I'm just going to live however I want. Do whatever I want, drink however I want, smoke however I want, waste all my money, shoot people if I wanted to, because either way, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm just going to live it however I want. But when that mindset changed and that hope entered my heart, that's when I was able to see, wow, I'm not a sinner. I'm righteous because of God. And so I started to live righteously. So through the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. you, you are cleansed. You are, you are, your sins are alleviated. Yes. And... And now you can walk a righteous path yes. and, and it's really changed your life. And I hope that your testimony reaches somebody that can relate to you yeah. that has gone through the darkness that you've gone through. Absolutely. And do you, have you been able to speak to some of your victims and, and reconcile with that? Yeah. Like I said, a lot of the enemies are now like friends, you know, they call them enemies back then, but um, yeah, we, we all share the same story, a similar background. Like I said, depression is depression. You know, sin is sin. Sadness is sadness. So we all share it and we're all trying to navigate it somehow in our own way. You know, but for me, I've truly been able to overcome it, not because of myself, not because I did well, but because I just believe the word, even though it didn't make sense to me. You know, uh, I use an analogy like of my son. You know, my kid, he wanted to drive my BMW. You know, I drive a six series and he's like, dad, he's 14 years old. Like, dad, I want to drive your BMW. And I'm like, no, you can't drive it. You'll crash. If you don't crash, you'll get hurt. If you don't get hurt, you'll get pulled over. I was explaining everything to him. But in the end, he told me, you don't love me. You just don't want me to touch your car. So he had his own thinking, his own logic, even though he's 14 years old. One side of my heart, I got angry at him. I was like, you know, this little kid, I just bought you Jordans. Like, how do I not love you? I let you live at my house. You don't do anything. You don't pay me, right? But on another side, I realized, oh, that's how I am in front of God. When I look at God, I'm like, why are you doing this? I don't understand. You know, why is it that I'm not um, letting my son drive the car? Is it because I don't 
I hate them. No, it's because I love them. I don't want them to get hurt. But we don't understand that, right? So when he's able to accept and when I ex explain to him, I love you. I'm not letting you drive it because of this. He just accepted it without having to understand. He didn't try to understand. And we're able to live under the same roof. He's able to enjoy the food and, and you know, new shoes. And I told him, when you get old enough, you can drive my car. I'll probably get you one of your own. He had to trust and accept what I said versus his own thought thinking, which was he doesn't love me. All right. So likewise, we have to do that. We don't have to understand everything. But when we accept things, that's when I was able to change. And that's what I teach people. What if your son came to you one day, Johnny, and said, Dad, I want to patch in a watching. I want to get put on. What, would, would, you, would you discourage him from that? Or would you let him bump his head and go through the, the, the pain and suffering you went through? You know, I, I think about that all the time. So, you know, I laugh because I was actually thinking about that just recently. You know, so um, I thought about it. If my kid wanted to join my neighborhood, what can I do? Well, the first thing is, what, what can I truly do to stop my son? You know, I learned that I have no control of anything, actually. I can tell him, hey, don't do this, look at your dad, whatever. But if he chooses to do what he wants to do, how can I stop him? If he chooses to leave and, and join a gang, another gang, how would I can't be with him 24-7. But I thought about it this way. You know, God, who, who loves my son more than me? Now, I love my son a lot. But God obviously loves my son more than me. And it says in the Bible that I will raise your children, meaning God. So I can't be with him 24-7, but God is with him 24-7. So when I put my faith in God, that's when I was able to just let go and have that freedom inside of my heart. Yeah, I love my son. I don't want him to bump his head. And my parents loved me. They didn't want me to bump my head. But through bumping my head, through this life, through everything, God was leading me. And now my mom is so proud of having a son like me. My father is so happy, you know. And likewise, I don't, I can't see the future. But if I believe again and I leave my son's life inside of the hands of God, how can it be bad? You know, I, I love my son so much, but God loves him more. So would God ever give, who in their right mind would give their son anything negative? So if anything happens to him, I try to see it as it's a positive thing because it was allowed by God. And that's how I'm able to be peaceful with everything. He's in his rebellious years now. He's 14. Right. He's prime time. Right. But the amazing thing is he listens to me. He asks questions. He sees the way that I live. It's different than other parents and other people that he sees. And he's able to have that level of respect all because of God. It's not anything that I did. Right. You know, a lot of people grapple with the idea of why do, why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. And what is your thought on that? So again, I believe that God allows everything to happen. You know, let me give you a story. There's an elder that was an Olympic cyclist in my, my church. And, you know, he, in 2000, he had that flight that, um, you know, we all know 9-11 happened in 2000. So the day before that, this flight that he had to go to the Olympics in New York and stuff like that, he broke his ankle. He severed it, actually. And it was really bad. He felt like he lost his career. He's like, this is career ending. I'm done. And he was cursing God. Why? Why did you allow me to have these issues? I'm your son. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm living well, whatever. But the next day, that same flight that he was on went into the Twin Towers. So it's all about perspective, actually. If you think of negative things, then negative things will come, come out, right? right? So he was able to then change his heart and be like, God, you love me. You stopped me from dying, actually, by breaking my ankle and not allowing me to come to the, the airport. So, so likewise, you know, we, we question God a lot, but we don't understand, you know, and that's why it's not about understanding, but it's about accepting what's happening. Right. When you accept, then you can move forward. If you try to understand, that's when depression comes because you're not going to get it. We, our brain is not, we're not God. So we can't understand him. Right. But when I accept it, that's when peace comes to me. Right. Something that's been floated out kind of recently about Jesus. And some people theorize that he pilgrimed to Tibet and was act during from 16 to, you know, around 25 mm -hmm. that he, he, there's, there's a missing part in the story. Mm -hmm. And some people believe that he was actually schooled by buddhist monks mm -hmm. and this is a far out theory right. have you heard that 
I haven't heard of that. Yeah. You know, but there's a lot of theories about, you know, uh, even amongst pastors. You know, I work with uh, this thing called the Christian Leaders Fellowship. And a lot of pastors are are into these little like knickknacks. You know, they like the the intricate details, right? But the the issue is the Bible, it's kind of it's a message, right? If I'm writing a message like a letter in prison and I send it to you and I say, Hey, um, how is your day? How is life? You know, um, I'm going to get married when I get out of prison. And it's in October. Let's say, can you come? Well, the, the main message of that letter is I'm getting married, not how was your day and whatever. So if we focus on the small things, we'll lose the bigger picture. You Interesting. Know? Right. Right. So for me, what is the what is the theme of the Bible? Yeah, Jesus did a lot of work. He walked on water. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. But the most important message was he came here. He died for our sins and he made the eternal sacrifice, our past, present and future sins. When he hung on the cross, he didn't fail. So he washed everything completely. And that's the message. We can fight about, you know, well, he did it here and he did there. None of that actually matters. What the most important thing is, you know, he died for us. and He made us righteous. And people nowadays still believe that they're sinners. But God says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every man to his own way. So that means we, like sheep, he knows we're going to go our way. We're going to fall because we have the flesh, you know. And we sin every day until we die because we're in this imperfect body. But by faith, we can believe we're righteous because Jesus did wash all of us. He didn't fail, you know. What are your thoughts of the Jewish people? Do you believe the Jews are the chosen people? Uh, in the Bible, it says that the Jews are the chosen people, and we are Gentiles. Whoever is not a Jew or Israelite or Hebrew Israelite is actually Gentiles, you know. But the thing about, you know, with the Jew Jewish religion is that uh, they believe in the Torah. They believe in the mitzvah. They believe in the Old Testament. They don't believe in the New Testament, you know. So a lot of people, like every other religion, the Jews believe you have to make atonement by yourself. You have to... Um, pray to God. You have to follow 613 laws in the Bible. And, and, you know, you have to make this atonement for your own, your sacrifice for your own sin. But we don't believe that because as Christians, you can't wash away all of your sins. It says in the Bible, if you break one, you break them all. James right. chapter 2, right? So he did that because he understood, like a person like me who went to prison, I looked at child molesters. I looked at people with jackets, like who they were no good. But under God's standard, we're, we all fall short. Right. We're all the same. You know, so he's not going to be like, oh, you're a child molester. You're going to go to hell. But you shot somebody, Johnny. You killed somebody. You, you're you're, you're going to go to heaven. Like, that's not how it works. Sin is sin. We all did evil. We're all evil people right. in the eyes of the Lord, in, in the eyes of God. Right. You know, they say Jesus wore a, was a very simple man, had very few belongings. Do you believe God wants us to prosper materialistically? Um, I think if God gives you materialistic and prosperity through his way, then that's grace. God gives everything. He says, I give wisdom and I give prosperity and I give goods. So God will give us whatever he gives us. You know, me personally, I was selling drugs even when I got out. You know, I was like, no, I can't get rid of it. I need money. I need to eat. But God was saying, don't, you know, if you put the kingdom of God above everything else, Everything else will be added unto you. So, you know, when I followed that, I was truly able to gain things like money and, you know, like notoriety and fame and things like that. Like, it's not anything that I did. So I do believe God gives you everything. If he wants you to be prosperous, I'm sure he'll give it to you. But there's some people where he doesn't allow them to make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, he allows them to struggle. And why is that? Because without struggle, we don't go to God. Right. If if I had everything I wanted, nice money, like nice car, clothes, women, everything, why would I need God? Right. I would just do it myself, you know. Oh, I'm stressed out, go and do drugs and, and overcome it by myself, you know. But God knew that we're this way. So he gives us problems and difficulties so that we can return to him. What is your favorite Bible verse? What, what was this, if you had to pull one verse, mm -hmm. which, which one comes to mind? For me, it's um, Hebrews 10, 14. It says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So 
One offering, Jesus Christ, perfected is in past tense, which means already perfect, and then it says forever. So it's not temporary, it's eternal. So through Jesus, we're perfected forever. And um, that's something that really has sustained my heart. Because when I look at myself, sometimes I think I'm a sinner. But when I look at the Bible, that doesn't change. The Word of God never changes. It stays solid. I'm able to see, oh, my thoughts change every day. My feelings change every day. But the Word of God never changes. So when I, con I don't confirm amongst myself, I look at that verse and it brings me hope every single time. Right. But Johnny, it's, it's important for people to understand that God will allow us to move mountains, mm -hmm. but we have to go to the base of that mountain and start digging, right? <laughs> hard work. God That's rewards cool. hard work. Is that your feeling and your understanding? I think God rewar rewards by grace. So yes, we have to work hard, but let's say I'm starting a business. You know, I would think about of course, I have to think about the logistics of it and I have to try my best and, you know, build it from the ground up. But I have to have one thing in the core of my heart. If God doesn't allow me to this business to prosper, it doesn't matter what I do. It's not going to it's not going to prosper. Right. So the, the, the base, the foundation must be God because God says I am strong. Right. I am the one who gives strength. That means we're all weak. That's what he's saying. Right. He gives power and strength. So if we put our, if we put our um, trust and belief in God, then that's how he'll build everything up for us. Of course, you still have to go to work. It's not like you have to pray every day and money's going to fall from the sky. That's not how it works. Right. But when you move with faith in your heart, it's different. Then I'm going to try my best and let's see what happens. You know, God wants us to believe, hey, I'm going to obtain this. God will help me. I am the son of God. He will help me. Right. Yes, I'm struggling now, but he's going to help me because he's the Alpha Omega. That means he's the beginning and the end. In the end, it ends with God too. Johnny, along the way, we've, we've met so many different Christians. There's Protestants, there's Catholics, there's Charismatics, there's um, so many different types of Christians. Do you consider yourself a fundamental Christian? Yeah, I would say a fundamental Christian. Um, I believe that just going back to the Bible is the most important thing. You know, there's one Bible, but there's 44,000 denominations. And that's crazy, you know, to me personally. Um, we're, we're going above denomination and we want to go back to the Bible. Because the Word of God, I believe, he, you know, Jesus never came down and said I was Protestant or I was, you know, like, like apostolic or whatever. He was saying that I came to save you. So he, I, I believe going back to the Bible is the most important thing. Right. So you, you, you take the Bible in its literal sense, or do you think some of these stories are allegoric? Well, I think it says in the Bible that God speaks through parables, right? And in nothing did he speak in parables. So he spoke only through parables. Jesus Christ had a lot of stories where he had to have analogies and stuff like that. And so I believe that, yeah, it's, it's, I take it as a literal sense, and I don't try to add to it. I don't take away from it. Um, the Word of God has to be accepted exactly as it is inside of your heart. And do you read the King James Version? Okay. Yes, the King James Version. Yeah. And what do you think of the Book of Enoch? Did you get into that a little bit? Yes, yes, the Book of Enoch. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think Enoch himself, um, I think, you know, he never died, actually. He was just taken. I don't know if you know the story. But he was just called up from God and he was a man who walked with God. Right. So, yeah, that story for me was really like pivotal because it didn't matter about like him doing well or anything like his deeds or his actions. It was all about he just walked with God. Everything God said, he just followed and then he was taken up. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts? You know, some people have some far out um, thoughts about the Bible and, you know, Ezekiel's wheel mm -hmm. and you hear this ancient alien narrative and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. do, do you dispel those kind of, you know, what ancients would see in the sky as a fallen angel could have been an mm -hmm. alien and, mm -hmm. you know, modern day humans might have a different, if we, you know, when we see an airplane, we're comfortable with it. Yeah. But if you were an ancient and saw a flying yeah, you disc, you'd think it's a, a chariot in the sky. Right. What are your thoughts about alien intervention in humanity? 
you mm-hmm. think that's part of the story or? I don't think it's part of the story personally because all of the things that were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and papyrus can be cross-referenced, right? So there's like a scroll of Isaiah, for example, right? And that's there's a book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. So I think that it could be that, you know, oh, they probably thought it was aliens or whatever. But again, I don't really get into that aspect because in the Bible it says, um, in the beginning was the Word of God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when I look at the Bible, I can't see God physically. None of us can, but I believe his word is him. So whatever it says in the Bible, it doesn't really talk about aliens and stuff like that. You know, it talks about demons. It talks about a lot of, you know, shamanism and stuff like that. But um, I don't really believe in that aspect. I take the Bible literally what it is because I believe it is the book of life. And it's not just a book, right? It's a library. It's a co- it's a compilation of books, you know. So I don't think... Um, you know, I personally don't believe in like that type of stuff, you know. Have you ever heard God audibly in your mind? Has um, he spoken to you? Some people say they have sp- literally heard God. Yeah, I, I haven't, to be honest. I've, I only, I feel like he's, he speaks to us through the scripture, you know, and that's why like I read the Bible. I've read it front to back 20 times, right? So the amazing thing about this book is that um, I don't hear God's voice. When I'm reading, I hear my own voice, right? But the, the amazing thing is the more I read this book, uh, the more different things start to be discovered. I've read it front to back. A man-made book, there's no way. Like I've read The Art of War, you know, and that was my favorite book in prison. They didn't allow you to. We had to get it, you know. I heard that was banned in yeah, California prisons. Yeah. Right. But I was able to read it and um, I read it three times total. First time I was like blown away. Wow, this is amazing. Second time I was starting to kind of really just read the parts that I liked, you know, about the mental health and this and that. And then the third time I couldn't really even get through it. I was I was already bored of it. But the amazing thing is when I read the Bible, every single time I read it, new things get discovered. It oh. unlocks these different mysteries in your life, yes. right? And that's how I feel like it's not a man-made book. Right. Or written by aliens or what you know. Sure, what I mean? sure. It's really something that came from God. Yeah. You mentioned you go back to China a lot. Do you still can you still pull kind of some Eastern philosophies that have some wisdom and integrate that into your Christianity? Is that Yeah. I, I utilize a lot of the the Eastern philosophies about the war, like back when there was a Qing dynasty. Um there was a guy named um General Zhuang. He was basically throwing a party. And um, I use this. It's funny that you asked it because I use this in my prison lectures too. So people always want to hear about the Chinese history and, you know, the imperialists and stuff like that. But anyway, so um, there's a story where this guy, he, he was a general. And he was a very great general. And he threw a feast because he had just overtaken one of the dynasties. And then he, um, the, the can- back then there was no light, so they used candles. So the candles blew out and then his concubine screamed. So somebody kissed the concubine and then he, she apparently grabbed one of the tassels that was, that, that one of the guys was wearing, the army men was wearing. And she's like, I got him. I know who it is. So the, the general thought about it. He's like, you know, if we light the candles right now, like I'm going to kill this guy, whoever it is, cause he's missing the tassel, you know? But he didn't want to mess up the mood. So he thought about other people. And he was like, you know, they came here to be merry. We just celebrated. No more killing. Let's stop this. So he had a change of heart. And he told everyone in the room, there was 200 people, rip off your tassel and throw it on the ground by order of the general. So he made everybody rip off their tassel, right? And then you can't find out who did it, basically. And then two years later, they were getting invaded. And he was surrounded by the other dynasty, the, the enemy, right? And they were going to kill him. But this one lone ranger guy, he, he rolled in and he saved him from seven people, right? He shot arrows at him, killed them, and he dragged them. And then they regained their um, kingdom. But that day he was like, I'm des-, the guy who rolled in and saved the, the general, he said, I'm deserving of death. He said, what do you mean? You just saved me. He said, that night when you threw, you know, threw the party, I was the one who got drunk out of my mind and tried to kiss your concubine. But he said, you know, I, I wanted to repay you my whole life. 
So out of everyone else, he was, a, he was the bravest one to come and save him. But if he had followed himself and he trusted himself, he would have killed that guy that night. And he probably would have ended up dead two years later. You know, so it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's the truth. This is actually a true story. You know, so it's teaching us that, hey, if you believe and follow your first impulse and you don't think deeply about other people, right, which is what the Bible is teaching us to think about other people, love thy neighbor as thyself, then we are actually going to make rash decisions that could really devastate a whole dynasty. And I use that a lot, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of cross Referencing. You know, I, I was invited to a church, Johnny, and the, the pastor's Kenyan, and a friend of mine um, wanted me to come. And, and this guy puts hands on people and cures them with miracles. And what are your thoughts about pastors that that do that kind of thing? Is that is that a little far out for you? or For me, that's yeah. a little far out, yeah. honestly. Um, I believe that God heals through his word. You know, my mom, for example, you had just mentioned, she had cancer, right? And she didn't, no one came and prayed over her and, you know, like put their hands on her. But the most important thing was when they told her that, you know, your your health, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So she had cancer and she felt like she was going to die. The fear of death came to her heart. But when the word of God said, if you wait upon God, I will renew your health. I will renew your strength. So God had to renew it, right? She said, everyone around me is telling me that I'm going to die. The doctor told me I'm going to die. My, my kids look at, looking at me like I'm already dead. Everyone's depressed. But the word of God was saying the opposite. No, you can live if you believe in God. That's, right? that's awesome. So when she believed that, that's when she was able to heal. But she went to the, the doctor a month later when that word entered her heart and she was cured. It wasn't anyone who, you know, she took extra vitamins or, you know, chemo, all that. None of that helped. It was the word of God. That's awesome, man. Now, is your brother still locked down? No, he's, he's, he's out. out too. So brother, you, mom and dad, it, the, the nucleus has been restored. 100%. And that, that is a glorious thing and, and, and a wonderful thing, man, to hear. Now, you uh, you know, your, your podcast, Righteous Nomad, mm -hmm. is very scripture-based. You mm -hmm. speak the word of God. Mm -hmm. You speak into people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it also, you, do you touch on kind of your redemption, your redemption story? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I heard that you're now going to through hoodstocks you're going to do street lamp podcast yeah and we're going to look for that yes. and that's an exciting thing yes shout out lucky <laughs> yeah and yeah. and hoodstocks and you are now in partnership doing an, a new podcast which is a neat thing yes. because you can reach a whole another demographic right. do you get letters from from china do people yeah yeah i do i get a lot of so they use wechat and uh, like whatsapp so I get a lot of messages and, and I don't write Chinese. I can speak it fluently, but I, I use, you know, Google Translate. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they tell me how it's an inspiration. And they always ask me things like, do you know any Italian mafia people? Because what they see in the movies is not just watching. They see Italian mobsters. They love those, you know, those movies. So, um, but it's, it's kind of funny. But yeah, they... Um, you know, but yeah, I, I do get a lot of fans and, and people who write me and stuff. And how can our audience, can they reach out to you if they want to ask you a question or just bounce some things off you? Absolutely. How, how can they reach you, Johnny? So you guys can reach me at Instagram. Uh, it's at no script fellowship. And that's the, yeah, the handle. So no script, script as in writing, fellowship, F-E-L-L-O-W-S-H-I-P, no script fellowship. And um, yeah, you'll be seeing me around as well. But that's what I usually use is Instagram, DMs. That's awesome, like that. man. Mm -hmm. Johnny, thank you yeah. so much for blessing us with your time, bro, and your that's message. Good. It's a real, real honorable, righteous story, bro. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, guys.